I think I'm going to go ahead and get started, giving people, I think, enough time to, to log in. So, welcome to the Abundant Yoga Business Call Series. My name is Esme. I'm the founder of 42yogis.com, a site dedicated to helping yoga students and teachers achieve personal and professional transformation through yoga. My guest today is yoga teacher, consultant, and entrepreneur, Nicole Devalia. No, that's not right. Diabola. <laughs> too, and I hate doing it to others. No. So, Nicole, yoga teacher and the founder of the Yoga Professional Academy, which is a successful yoga business consulting firm. And today we're going to talk about how to grow your yoga business. So before we get started, uh, get some water, turn off your cell phone, and get some pens and paper ready because you're going to want to take notes. Want to take notes. And while you're silencing your device, I would like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about us. So I have a rare health disorder called dysautonomia. My nervous system doesn't work right. And we tried surgery and drugs and drugs and really nothing helped. And yoga transformed my health and well-being in a way that my doctors didn't think was possible. So I started 42 Yogis, 42 Yogis in April 20 to help other people achieve the health and wellness that they desire as well. My background is in small business management and my, and my goal is to empower yoga teachers around the world to run more profitable yoga businesses. Together, I believe Together, I believe we can help a million yoga students achieve transformation and wellness. So my guest today, Nicole, has been teaching yoga since 1984. She has over 30 years of experience in yoga and business. Nicole specializes in offering state-of-the-art training and resources for individual yoga teachers and large yoga institutions alike. So welcome, Nicole, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so how you got into yoga, how you got into business, into business. Yeah. So I first um, learned about yoga when I was in college, and I had a dance teacher have a yoga for dancers workshop. So um, it was just totally about the asanas and how to be, you know, more um, limber for the dancing and so forth. But it was one of those funny things where I just, I really liked it. And I just took to it, and without ever making a conscious decision, I just started doing it every day. And, you know, the benefits from that really, you know, grew. But then, flash forward, um, after I'd graduated, I was in San Francisco, and I had a desk job. And I wasn't doing the yoga. I wasn't dancing. I had, pain. I had excruciating back pain. It was starting to radiate down my arms, down my legs. And I, I just felt like I was in this downward spiral and just needed to get out. The woman who sat across from me, for me that I had done some yoga um, college, said, oh, why don't you try this place called Ananda? And I managed to get to one of the classes. And the second time I tried to go, I got lost. I was still kind of new to San Francisco. And I just felt myself going in this downward spiral. And then what happened is um, I got a flyer in the mail. Okay, so this tells you how old I am. It was back when we didn't have cell phones. You know, people weren't on the, the internet. The internet, we didn't have the email. But we had flyers. So it was, they, I was gotten on their mailing list. And so I got this flyer for a yoga teacher training. And I just held this flyer and I was just like, I have to do this. This is my ticket. Um, you know, I don't know why, but I have to do this. And I did. It was the best decision I ever made. And I said, the rest is history. And I feel like I've had every single position in the field of yoga that you can imagine, all the way up to um, been on the Yoga Alliance prenatal standards for the education, you know, what, what's required for a program to, to be registered with the Yoga Alliance if they're teaching prenatal yoga. And more recently, it was on the first accreditation committee for the International Association of Yoga Therapists. And we were charged with implementing those newly developed standards for yoga therapy training programs and creating an application and counseling and helping people um, figure out how to get through the maze of all of that, the policies, the procedures, and we accredited our first uh, 12 programs last June. So it was really exciting. Offering um, 
yoga professional services through yoga professional academy so that's how i got started and where i am now in the short the short version <laughs> that's fabulous and then how long has yoga professional academy been around academy been around well i really just started that um just a little over well probably just about a year ago to really kind of um bring together um, this higher level of service. There's so much that is changing in the world of yoga from standards. Uh, its, it's growth is just exploding. Um, it's growing at 20% a year. And that figure, I think, is something you've probably heard as well as part of why we connect in a year. But we have so many yoga professionals struggling to make a living, feel like, or you know, maybe they're making a living, but they just feel burnt out. Making a living, but they just feel burnt out because they're going from here to there and they just never really feel like they're really living that yoga life they love, why they got into yoga in the first place. So uh, that to really put together all my years in these different areas of yoga to support other people to really be able to live their yoga and really feel some abundance in their life so that they can do their practices and have that health and healing for themselves and you know, reaching that, you know, one by one, we reach that worldwide audience really important and something I keep hearing from people is you know I spent three thousand dollars on my yoga training and I have no idea how to make a living mm -hmm. it's lame they are working you know part-time jobs at coffee shops and teaching 20 hours a week and they're teaching for free because they weren't taught how to do the business side of it so and I think it's really important and I think it's really important that we take these and in love with yoga and empower them to actually make a living helping others. Absolutely. The biggest challenges that you see new yoga teachers have in business? Is um, the mindset that the yoga community has. Because there's, frankly, I've talked to people in other professions, you know, who are like, say, you know, a dentist or a dentist or other professionals who are also um, and so we, in a sense, share that in common with other professionals that we need to go outside and get either, you know, be part of a large part of a larger group where there's management for us or give us training. But the special problem I find with the yoga community is, especially if we really feel we're yogis first, we have this inner conflict about charging money. We have an inner conflict about, um, you know, power, money, um, and putting ourselves out there, marketing, there's just, so, so that often while we're doing one thing on this side, quickly blocking it on the other side because we haven't really looked inside and, and really sat with what it is we need to do and how we need to get our, to serve because we can offer the most wonderful service and best class and if no one shows up, then we're not really doing service. And to really do service in a bigger way, and that bigger way might, it doesn't mean we all have to be global, that bigger way may just having full classes in your local and serving, you know, in a way where you serve with integrity so you're not your students, uh, and really being able to do that. So, so it's a, a lot of the coaching I do, and, and the one-on-one, -on -one is really finding those blocks. Because it's like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm that, I'm doing all these things. This is like, process what are these other actions you're doing what are the words you're actually saying and and they're in conflict and so i think that's the biggest problem our community faces thing that i've noticed and even you know in myself sometimes is the language i use will often reflect what i really think that i'm a little bit afraid to admit uh, yeah. something i was having a problem with um, when i first started 40 yogis is i kept thinking it's hard to make money no, it's not hard to make money at all. I just need to change my mindset. So, yeah. and I, I too didn't want to ask people. I didn't want to sell anything. I didn't want to put myself out there because I felt like it's somehow being dishonorable to the service I'm trying to provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, and the other thing too, I think when people get excited about yoga and the transformation it's given them, the next natural thing is to learn more in the yoga teacher training program is where most people turn. And back when to make it become a career, they were doing it simply to deepen their studies. It was an intensive way to learn more about yoga and be mentored and, and get into the 
more skills and the philosophy and, and all these other aspects of yoga. And only a small number were actually choosing it as a career path. And so what's an interesting development today is that a lot of people, they go in and it's like, okay, if I become a yoga teacher, because they see out in the world a lot of people who that has been their career path, they automatically think that that's now can be my career and that they can just jump from a 200-hour training and expect there to be jobs for them or you know, some magical way their classes are going to fill up and, and it's just going to work and you know they don't have the training and it can be really hard on people when they kind of have this these great expectations don't that don't really match the reality so they, um, take the the teacher training courses and, and also look at that three thousand dollars as an investment in you what did you get out of your teacher training what transformation did you get out of it and then <clears throat> to make and many people that I'm speaking to they just like you said they expect that my class is actually going to fill up and I'll be able to get a job and especially in larger markets there's a lot more competition for these jobs you're not just competing with the staff studio to studio to teach all these different classes and if you don't have a track record or experience it can be really hard to get into that and uh, anyway uh, our topic today is social media, so um, let's let's move on a little bit. Um, how can social media help a budding yoga teacher? Not a quick fix. So especially for the budding yoga teacher, don't think that <clears throat> okay, you're gonna you are gonna learn some things, actionable th tips, and things you can start. By, but social media is and should be a part of your marketing program, and. But it isn't the only thing you should do because, again, your business is it's, if you expect business like income to come back from you, you need to run it like a business. And with social media, if you go out and you just, you know, um, act like come to my class, I have this class, come to this workshop. Um, that looks like just like you're an advertiser, a bunch of commercials on your social media feed, and you're going to actually repel students. People aren't going to be doing that. So what you need to learn is how to be social on social media and create engagement on social media, create interest, provide value, and then if you're doing that and people are interested say what you're offering, then when you do say, by the way, I have a class, or hey, this workshop's coming up, then people are interested and they're going to pay attention. So the first thing is, I think, just getting kind of understanding the platform, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, whichever one it is, get your feet wet and be social on it first so you understand it, and then you start bringing it. Yeah. Something that drives me absolutely crazy is when I see someone on Twitter and all they do is they post links back to their website and say, hey, I'm doing this. Hey, check out this thing that I'm doing. And it's just, it feels really spammy. And I don't like, I don't think the vibe of being a spammer on social media is the kind of vibe that a lot of people in the yoga industry really want to put out into the universe. Right. They, like, they don't have the training or the education. Right. Well, I think a lot of people you got to be on social media. Oh, you promote your business. Get on social media. Get on, you know, so they get on there, but then it's kind of like being thrown into the water. And it's like, okay, what, how do I swim? What stroke do I do? What do I, you know, now what? And they're just trying. And so I think it's really important to have some training. It doesn't have to be expensive training. Have some mentoring and be observant. You know, see what other people are doing. The way I learned a lot of my social media is um, when my uh, best-selling book came out, my book mentor um, was involved with uh, Ricky Lake, and before her last show was started, she told a bunch of us, you know, get involved with them on social media. So she also told us how to do that. And I did, and so I started interacting, and their social media producers noticed me, and then I ended up being highlighted on several of their social media platforms, and they took me under their wings and helped to mentor me. And so a lot of what I was doing was observing them, observing, observing the people who knew how to do it, who got it right. 
and learning from there, asking questions, and, and taking trainings as well. But that mentoring piece is so, so key and so important. So it, it, and, and that experience put me on the cutting edge of some of the social media. Um, it seems kind of old hat now, but I was actually part of a select invited group to be in the audience for the first time was produced where we were actually allowed to bring our devices and tweet and post live. Now, you see that on TV now fairly commonly, but I don't know. So like when we go to the show, when you go on a set, the first thing security does is, okay, no phones, no computers, no cameras, no electronic devices. So it was really kind of a revolutionary thing to be part of that, where he said, bring it on and um, start, start posting. Uh, so, so you definitely um, need to learn you know, and, the, the, and observe and uh, learn about it. And then, then you can have good results. Speaking about um, social media mentors, uh, what are a couple of yoga pros on social media that you're really impressed with how they handle it? What, what I see, um, there's several different yoga pros out there. And, um, and one of the things I want to put out front, full disclosure, is some of them to help them. So I want to make that out clear that you don't have to do it all yourself. And those people often who have the bigger followings have you know, somebody who's posting for them, they have a service that's uh, posting for them, they're using um, some different tools to, to post, and, and so forth. So I wanna just put that out there. Um, and there's people in different categories. So um, there's the, the people who are advertising that they do social media, and, um, for yoga people, and the ones that you see the most are, you know, some of them are doing, um, you know, a pretty good job of it. Like Justin Michaels, I think he he puts out a lot of good content, free content, and so forth. There's there's several different people out there um, in that space. Brett Gregory um, is the yoga Facebook pro, if you know, things like that. And then then you have um, the yoga teachers who are kind of like the yoga stars who have a lot of followers simply because they're stars. It's just their name. So a lot of people like because they see them like a journal or see them on TV or whatever, they're gonna get a lot of followers because of their celebrity status. And then you hear about um, the Instagram stars that are out there, like Yoga Girl, I think is probably one that's been in the news a lot. And they even though they have stories where they started organically, they they work it. You know, they're they're posting at least four times a day. They are having other people help them do photography. People, but don't um, be naive and think that it's totally, that they just did it, it was totally organic, that there wasn't some thought to it, that they're not putting in a lot of time um, or getting help to get those big numbers of followers. I think this is actually a, a good lead into a user question that I have. I was going to save it towards the end, but. Margaret wants to know what the pros and cons are of hiring someone to help with social media versus doing it all by yourself. Yeah, so if social media is gonna be a big part of your business plan, and that's, that's a whole nother conversation is how big it should be. You pretty much need to have a social media presence these days because people wanna check you out to see if you're the real deal. Facebook is actually a bigger search engine than your website. If somebody's like checking out your name, if you have some Facebook posts, those are more likely to show up on Google than your actual website. Um, so you need to be on social media. And if it's part of your business plan to, to be more than just, you know, yes, I'm the real deal, here's my business card on social media, um, I really do encourage you not to do it all because you can end up wasting a lot of time. Now, not doing it all yourself can mean a of different things and um, and also how you bring other people on or tools to help you um, can make a difference as well so for example you can uh, schedule your post uh, just with Facebook or there's some tools that we, we're gonna um, like Hootsuite or Gremlin or different tools and Facebook itself where you can schedule your post so you can sit down do your bunch of different posts in a really concentrated amount of time, put them out throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, and so forth. You, 
Um, there's programs so you can have it repeated. So that's something you can do yourself that's using a tool to help. Now you can also hire um, companies, um, really, or if you never answer them or respond, they kind of feel put off and they're not going to feel connected to you. So what you have to do, if you have those time posts, if you have somebody else posting material and content for you, you've got to go back and you need to be the one who responds. So like for me, if, um, if I respond to you directly, you know, answer a question or it's me. I may have somebody else post content for me. I may have certain things that are queued up that are going to post, but I'm going to, I'm going to always be the one who's engaging directly with you. And I think that's really, really important because otherwise that can be a real turn off. So to what degree you go with, with having help with your social media, you need to kind of, I think, step back and say, who are your clientele? Are you going to find your clientele on um, social media? And if so, which platform are they on? Um, you know, so I, th I think often there's a lot of other questions that you'd want to answer first before investing a lot of time and money and bringing other people on to help you. So, but that's an excellent question. And you know, I use uh, Buffer. I can't get enough of Buffer. Yeah. Um, but what are some of your favorite social media management tools? Uh, Hootsuite is a kind of, I think, a standard, and um, you can schedule different things on that, and you can get the free version of that. And um, you can also be seeing different streams uh, at one time. So again, if you, the, the more you do, then um, the more that becomes important. Hootsuite, you can also do the scheduling that I'm talking about. Um, I also like Gremlin. It's just kind of a little more user friendly um, for me, and I can post things again on, on pretty much all the different social media um, platforms for that. I know a lot of people like Buffer. Um, so, so again, I, I tell people start with something that's free. You know, don't go out and make the big investment and have a, where you're not seeing a return on it because you, you'll have a learning curve. So always find you know the free solution first learn on that before deciding whether it's worthwhile in your business plan or not to There's a lot of benefit, at least for me, in using a service like Buffer yeah. because there's only so much time that I have every day. And no matter how hard I try, I never seem to have more time. And with Buffer, on Monday night, I can plan out everything that I'm going to share on Twitter for Tuesday. And Tuesday comes and I don't even have to think about it. I just know that things are going to be posting that are engaging to my audience. Mm -hmm. And of course, if someone responds, then it goes to my cell phone and I can uh, just write them a quick little reply. But I think it's really something that people have struggled with is finding time throughout the day to say, okay, well, at this time I'm going to take five minutes and I'm going to send a tweet. And I think that that perception of the time requirement every day, every time they want to send a tweet is part of what turns them off. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happens is every time we go on to post something, we start seeing all the other posts. And we can get lost. So we might say like, oh, let me just post this really fast. And then, you know, I need to be someplace or I need to do the next thing or where, where did the day go? So that's the other thing about scheduling your posts is you're not on it as often. and and the other tip is to be really disciplined about your use. So you want to engage. So that also means liking other people's posts. And you know, so it's not just when they engage about the thing that you posted about. Um, but every time there's a video, I rarely watch the videos on social media because I go, did I sit down to watch a cute cat video? You know, is that why I'm here? No, it wasn't. But sometimes it's like, yeah, it's the end of the day and I want to laugh, I'll, I'll watch the video. So it's clear when you are on social media, you know, how much time you want to be and what you're there to do. That's, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. It gets really easy to get sucked in. So, and especially with things like Facebook, you know, you log in to share something on your page and then you see something, oh, my friend's having a bad day and you just kind of get pulled in. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, moving moving back to 
back to the questions here. Um, I think there's more social media networks than people have time to do, and not all social media networks for everybody in every situation. So as a yoga teacher, what three networks do you recommend? Okay, so um, I, I like the number three, and I'm not going to give a straightforward answer. Here's why. <laughs> Because you want to be on the ones where your client, where your potential students are, where your students hang out. So sometimes, you know, asking your students what social media are you on is going to help you. But the one I do recommend everybody be on would be definitely um, Facebook, because so many people are on Facebook, and it is, as I said earlier, it acts like a search engine, and that will show up higher. Um, in a lot of uh, searches, people are searching and trying to find you. Um, Facebook, also when you um, are ready to do advertising, right now Facebook ads are outperforming Google ads. It's like the best um, type of Also say it with a caveat, make sure you get training in it because you could also waste a lot of money because you think like, oh, these are the good ads, but if you don't know how to go in and select your audience, and how to can waste money on it. But when you're ready, you want to be on um, Facebook for that reason. So, so Facebook is number one. And probably the second one that's really up and coming is for a lot of people, but not great. I mean, what I usually say is not everyone. It's good. It depends on who your audience is. So if you are primarily teaching seniors, um, maybe uh, it's corporate work you do, then maybe Instagram's not the place that you're going to get the most engagement that's going to bring you warm bodies. So there's engagement that brings you social proof. So it's like, wow, they got all these followers and likes. They must be doing something right. And there's you know value in that. Versus if you're on social media to get warm bodies to your workshops or warm bodies into your classroom, you need to be on the platform that works best for you. So if you're more corporate, and you're going into businesses, then you might want to be on LinkedIn would be a good one to be on. Um, Twitter, again, Twitter is, uh, there's a lot of controversy with how good Twitter is or not. So again, it's learning how, if you're going to use Twitter, how to engage. One of the things is what I like about Instagram is, so if, if you decide that Instagram is one of your, uh, you know, where your audience, you can find people on Instagram, is that it has uh, a little, Thing, and some of the other sites do too, where you can simultaneously post to Facebook. Again, with that, you don't necessarily want to post all your hashtag laden Instagram uh, posts onto Facebook because people, because uh, it can seem spammy. Look, if you're doing photo after photo and all these hashtags versus on Instagram, that's more commonly done. So, um, so, so, and then the other one that I'll mention is Pinterest. So if you have, um, also, like a, a, a yoga studio where you're selling, um, you have like a little boutique and you're selling something, or maybe you have doTERRA oils or you know some side business or something as well um, that is part and parcel of your yoga business, then Pinterest can be very uh, useful. So, um, so just kind of going back to, to narrowing that down, where's your audience? You got to ask Facebook and probably Instagram, Twitter, and maybe LinkedIn, depending, again, on who your audience is, and what kinds of products and services you're selling. I think those are the big ones. Um, I, I do agree with LinkedIn. It can be good, and it can be really horrible, and <laughs> it can be a massive time suck. Um, but there's been a lot of yoga professional groups popping up on LinkedIn, which I really like because not just connect with students, but with like-minded professionals who down the road may say to their friend, oh, I know someone in that city and they can help you and they can send you business potentially. Um, but it, it, it's not for everybody. About the social media platforms, like for example, I use them for more than you know just marketing purposes because if you have some online course or even a live workshop or something and you want to keep people connected, you can use the private groups. Um, a lot of the training programs I'm in and mentoring programs, we have private groups on Facebook. Um, 
and, and that continues over all the membership platforms. So even if you have a membership site that either you're attending or you, know, you have students going to, people will use the Facebook groups more than if you have a platform on your membership site. And that's, that's where the content is. Um, I use it for so many different kinds of business connections. Um, it's gotten me on TV. It's gotten me uh, guest blog posts. It's gotten a whole slew of other um, types of marketing as well as training connections um, and so forth. So we can use it in the non-obvious ways too. So that's just another reason why we need to have some presence on the social media because that's, that's where, that's our like town square now. It's our, a place where we're coming together and meeting each other. Something that I think is also important to point out is social media is an extension of your brand and everything you do on social media, whether you like it or not, is going to reflect upon your brand. And once it's out there, you never know if it really goes away. Lead a post doesn't mean it's gone. And I think that's something that people really need to be aware of. And you, if you are saying things on Facebook, and talking about how you're having such a horrible day and you're so negative all the time, it's going to be a big disconnect to your yoga brand where you're trying to be a positive force for energy and abundance. Absolutely. And, and to that, when, when you post, um, you know, unless, it, you know, again, you want to really be aware, even if it's your personal, um, uh, you know, not a page, but your personal account on Facebook, Everybody, you know, people are seeing that, and whether it's going to be your students or somebody who might refer to you, it's really, really important. So, for example, the, the kinds of things to the post is a um, good laugh. But, you know, when I see a cartoon before I'll repost it, um, in some cases even click the like, there might be something that will make me chuckle, but it would be really sort of against my brand, okay, for my brand. Um, I try to stay away from swear words. Other brands, that's kind of like, you know, that's part of the swagger and the, what they're, you know, about. So I'm just saying for me, um, so like I wouldn't repost that. And I can enjoy it. I'm very conscious of what that shows as part of what my brand is. So that's just, just an example um, of the things, uh, of what you comment on. Um, I personally, I stay away from, you know, politics, for example. Controversial things and let's, you know, you're, you're prepared for some divisiveness on there. So those are just a couple, a couple of tips that really for your brand, um, kind of stay away from. Speaking of branding and social media, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen yoga professionals make? Just talked a little bit about them. So the number one is the spamming. And, you know, we're like, well, I'm not a spammer, but what appears to be the spamming. So there's kind of a general rule of, of thumb, about 80%, and, and some people will say if it's about 80% of your content, if it's content, it's things that people are interested in, and only 20% about it is um, go read my blog post or um, come to this webinar, come to this workshop, you know, here, here's something about the class. That 80-20, so about you know, that, you know, one to four type of um, thing. Is, is so, so important because there's some people who just go on and that's all they do and then they go off and they wonder why nobody there. So that's number one. Um, <clears throat> number two, what you brought up is being negative. Now being real and being negative are two different things. And you never have a bad day, nothing ever goes wrong. But it's the way you frame it. It's whether or not you can Turn that bad day into a chuckle and laugh at yourself. Whether or not you can um, put a positive spin in the end. And on it. Um, I know one woman who she has something like triple positive breast cancer. You know, so you know, and she has young kids. And, that, and she's posting about her experience and the chemo and all that, but in a way that she is an inspiration to everybody. And she's always posting positive things. And she's, you know, she's getting more and more followers because she's showing how she's being a fighter. She's being real. You know, she'll, you know, post photos of, you know, being her bald head or say like, you know, 
tough day today because I didn't get to go to my child's recital. Um, but then she'll talk about how that just, you know, makes me want to kick cancer in the butt and move on and, and charge forward. You know, so she always puts a positive spin on it. And she's inspiring people through her problems. So, so it's okay to be real, but if you're on the products um, and, and there's, there's just a, a tone of negativity or even it's, um, or even it, I've seen people trying to do positive posts. Well, you know, everybody's putting you down because they're so bad, but you know, we'll still stand strong. It, you know, there's that negative twist. To it. So, so that negativity, you can be real. You can um, not pretend to be negative. Don't be a downer. And then the third one is, and you know, this doesn't happen too often, so I don't want to square people off. But if you get somebody saying something negative about you, about the class, maybe you have a product or whatever, is to try to ignore them or engage them and have a back and forth about the issue. So you don't want to do either extreme. You don't want to I just totally ignore that or something, but meet it with respect. <coughs> Excuse me. And just honor their position. Sorry you feel that way. Maybe we could talk about this offline. Um, and just say something honoring. Move on. Those are the two things. From yoga in Arlington. <coughs> as a prime example of what not to do on social media. So I, I don't know if you remember the, the uproar from September. But for those listening, on September 11th, 2014, Bikram Yoga in art a 9-11 discount in commemoration of the anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks of yoga classes. Immediately, everybody on Twitter started voicing their displeasure. And people were accusing them of being greedy, of being shallow, tragedy. The first rule of crisis management is to own your mistake if you made a mistake. And even if your audience thinks that you've made a mistake, but you don't necessarily. It's still a good idea to own your mistake. So what the owner, Zara, should have done is say, you know, I'm very sorry for our mistake and our lapse in judgment. We didn't mean to offend anybody, and I see now this is in poor taste. I'm very sorry. Instead, she started arguing with people. She started arguing them on, with, with them on Facebook and on Twitter, and then she started spouting conspiracy theories about upcoming terrorist attacks, and therefore everything she said is justified. Needless to say, it was only a matter of time before the Washington Post got wind of what was going on. They asked her for a comment, and she compared the social media outrage to that of Ray Rice, the NFL player who beat his wife. And, and she lost a lot of business, and I'm honestly not sure if she's going to continue to survive. I don't know if she'll make it to this September. And it, it's that, that's a big problem that I see a lot of people, like, if they make a mistake, they don't own it. Like, they don't say, oops, sorry, my bad, I totally didn't see how that could be taken wrong, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, I didn't realize how that could offend someone. Instead, mm -hmm. they argue and they try to get defensive and they try to justify their position which only makes the matter worse mm -hmm. then you can google Bikram Yoga Arlington mm -hmm. it still comes up the Washington Post story still comes up mm -hmm. and it will for the end of time yeah good case study own your mistake and don't argue with people on social media so mm -hmm. there's a difference between an arguing and getting belligerent and those who get belligerent are always the ones who have a really terrible brand experience and often end up in major mainstream media. Right. Anyway, um, getting a little back on topic here. Um, what advice do you have for someone who's just getting started on social media? Okay, um, not to do more than one at a time to get started with, because you'll get overwhelmed. And you know, aiming for three is, a, I think, a good starting place. But um, so, so again, Facebook is a good place to start. So you have your personal pay, um, account, and then you can start your uh, business account. And um, I don't have time to really go into it, but Facebook has a lot of different there are logarithms, and um, 
not to get frustrated when people don't seem to be um, seeing your posts um, because it takes some time and it takes some strategy to really get that engagement. And Facebook makes it hard for us as business owners. They used to make it very easy for us and we got used to that. But they want us to, of course, buy their advertisement to make sure everybody sees it. But there's, there's definitely um, tools and, and tips and techniques you can do to, to get it. Like I said, observe what people whom you admire are doing it. So it can be other yoga people. And just because they have a lot of likes or engagement, use it with a, a critical eye. So for example, something um, that tends to get a lot more likes are um, young girls doing yoga in bathing suits, especially if there's out you know, in an ocean seeing you know, an exotic place behind there. That will get you lots of, of um, likes, tension, but is that part of your brand? So I'm not saying that's bad, but it may or may not be part of your, your brand. So that's to say, when you're looking and you're seeing, you you have to decide um, what are they doing right, what are they doing that makes sense to me, what doesn't make sense to me and my brand. You can also be following other heart-centered entrepreneurs, so it doesn't have to necessarily be yoga to learn from. So I learned a lot of my social media who I felt really good about, who felt like heart-centered people, you know, not um, not the old-fashioned kind of ad people or marketers that are all about buy now or scarcity or you know, um, strong arming kinds of, of media. But find the heart-centered people that you relate to and um, set a timer so that you don't spend too much time on social media and really reflect what is your goal. So who's your audience? Who's your ideal client? And what are your goals on social media? Are you just wanting to have some presence um, on there, kind of like a business card. Um, some people, even before they have a website, will, you know, it's just much cheaper and easier. You can direct people to your Facebook page and kind of use that like a, a website and share some information and things there. Um, so the main thing is keep it simple and always be learning and observing, see what works and what doesn't work. Okay. I, we've got about 12 minutes left, so I have some user questions that I would like to get into. Um, a question from Andrea. These are more about uh, about advertising. Um, she wants to know um, about the cost for an average campaign um, with something like Facebook or Twitter, and how long is it before you start to see results? Facebook advertising, and I believe Twitter too, I'd have to double check, is that you can set what you want your campaign cost to be. So you could maybe say you want it to be $5 a day. And what they'll do is Facebook will just, once it reaches the $5 point, it will stop showing your ad until the next day. So you can really control your cost. You can also do open-ended advertisements and if you're not paying attention it could rack up into the hundreds very very quickly and um, be more expensive how quickly you see results depends um, on a variety of factors one thing is is what so one of the things that you can do is um, get people to come and like your page so it's not paying people to like your page it's doing advertisements to say you know here's here's my my brand love yoga, click like if you like yoga, something, you know, something like that, where you're getting, you're using that to get them to come to your page and to like it. Those you can usually um, see results with pretty quickly because you're not, it's not a big ask. People aren't leaving Facebook to, when they click on it. They're staying in familiar territory and you're only asking them to like something that they probably, you know, appreciate and like. So for something like that, it's pretty easy. And then in terms of the ads, this is why I say you do need to either have somebody who's done Facebook ads before or do some training on it. Because you, I've known people who have done, you can spend hundreds of dollars and really not get any results. And, and of course, we don't want to do that. So, even, so what you need is 
really some help with it is, is just kind of the bottom line because it's not only what ad what what your ad says what your image says it's who you select to market That's why Facebook can be so effective because you can really target um, what other people like you can have look-alike audiences to a competitor you can choose the countries the income bracket age all kinds of things that's why it can be effective so there's that but what your ad looks like what it says and then what you're taking them to maybe you have a really cool ad and I I did this early on I got all these clicks to my landing page I was paying for the copy in graphics for my landing page so so there's several so again depending on what you want and the more complicated it is, the more you're asking for people, really the more professional tools and help that you need and experience to actually get those results. So I, so I really strongly advise you get, get the free likes first, get your friends you know, to come and, and like for you, get your colleagues. I mean, we, you know, um, actually, I don't know where we're going to announce this. There's some way we can all help each other. Um, uh, on social media too, just to kind of get things uh, started and, and learn a little bit more. Yes, fabulous. And uh, as long as we're on the topic of Facebook and marketing, I would, uh, I'll send out when I send out the replay a link to Brett Gregory's work. He is fabulous, and every Tuesday he gives a free webinar about Facebook marketing for yoga. He says. I want to do a really good job, but I have no social media training. What's the one thing I can do that will make my social media look more professional? Actually, like the thing that makes it look the least professional and have simple backgrounds. So if you notice, this may has got a white background. You know, I have white with just very, very little. And I actually have um, three professional lights on here that I got off of um, Amazon that weren't too expensive. You don't necessarily have to go that far because I know Ismay doesn't have professional lights. I don't think where she is, so you can see you can still look good. But make sure you have clean backgrounds and good lighting is is the number one thing for um, when you're posting photos. Um, and posting photos is a good thing. Um, I mean, if you're on Instagram, that's the only kind of post you can do. Facebook likes photos and videos. Kind of the same thing with the video. You also now have to make sure you have good sound quality. Um, so those are some key things, and um, it, and then the other thing is you can, you know, go out and find news stories, or you can follow other people who have the kinds of um, stories or links to blog posts that are professional and that you like, and then you can share those. So you're not always necessarily having to come up with the content yourself. But again, you follow other people or other pages that have content. That is simpatico with what you want to do and what you want to share, and you share share those. And then it's um, always good to say a little. Um, oh, and this is something else that saves time: is you can link your Facebook page like to Twitter to other social media, so that when you post your Facebook from your page, it will go to like your Twitter account, for example. So keep this can be going out to more than. More than one place. It's not just you know for your small following in one place. It could be uh, for more. So um, so that's why I'd get started. Is um, you know and just kind of the same thing is you want to you want to talk to people in a personal way, but you don't want to be overly familiar and you know assume and tell them about every little little thing you did. Um, but be engaging and say, um, what do you think of this? Uh, I actually often find that sometimes just by my ask question when I post a link to something, um, you know, do you agree? That I don't even necessarily get a lot of more people saying yes I do or no I don't, but I'll get more people actually viewing it and stopping and thinking about it just by posting. Questions are fabulous for engagement. Yes. Okay. The question we're going to have a time to get to is from Jessica. And she wants to know how active do I have to be on social media in order to make a difference for my business? Okay. So what I would try to do is have um, at least one to two posts a day. Um, but as we, as you learned, you don't have to be on social media every single day. Um, you know, I was looking at some of the the Instagram um, quote stars. 
they're posting at least four times a day. Um, but again, you have to decide, you know, how, how busy do you want to be? But that one to two, that regular engagement is really good. It could be that you once a week set up and say, like, okay, I'm going to spend 20 minutes, schedule a post, and go from there. Or every day, you just spend a little time, you go through your feed and just share something. Because maybe you don't, you know, you're still trying to figure out what content yourself. But you just go and you um, quickly scroll through and, and share some, some content. But um, the other thing um, is the time of day can make a difference to kind of find out when your people are on online. And I talk about that more because we are running out. Um, so if you don't mind, um, I have a, a blog post on the 42 Yogis website. And at the end of it, there's a, a video that I, I talk about things like the time of day to post and some other things to avoid and things you can do on free. Um, and you can access that by going to the 42 Yogis website and find the social media post. And, and I'll go into detail at some more things like that that you can do. And, and I'll send that out as well when I send out the replay. OK, great. And challenge. And so why don't you tell us more about that? You know, when we were setting this up, what are some of the you know main questions you get? And one of them was, how do I get more uh, followers on Instagram? It's a great question. Um, I kind of came a little more lately into using Instagram. So I don't have a ton of follower, followers on Instagram. And I know one of the best ways to do it is to do a challenge. And when we do it together. So I've created a, um, a Facebook page. So this is also, you can be a learning experience. See how I'm using a Facebook page um, to create some educational free content for uh, people. And we're going to do a 30-day challenge starting uh, about a week from today. So we have time for people to sign up and get on and uh, get a account set up if you don't have an Instagram account. And during that 30-day challenge, we will be committing to posting one to two posts on Instagram every day. But in addition to that, in our Facebook group, we're going to share our Instagram handles and like each other or follow each other. So that, and we can also follow each other on our other social media platforms. About different tips and things about, you know, what are the uh, most commonly used hashtags? What you know, some things about like the photos. What photos are more engaging? Um, how to respond uh, in a timely manner to to people? So we'll also be getting tips and also be inviting the entire community across an article or something worked for you share it with the group so we can spend 30 days together really you know jump starting growing our Instagram followers and learning a lot together I think it'll be a lot of, of fun and I think it may you know like I say we can trickle over and start liking each other's pages on Facebook and following each other in other ways too yeah, it's gonna be a blast it's gonna be a lot of fun be true to who you are and your true self. It's like, you know, I've gotten into social media. I get invitations to Hollywood. I get swag. This is some social media swag I got for promoting um, in um, MS, uh, social media. I'm a yogi first, and I always try to remember that. You know, so whether it's about my branding or what I'm in Hollywood or I'm at the ashram, and I make sure I spend as much time as I can at the ashram recharging is be true to who you are if you as I say you observe other people to learn but you then express it yourself and that's how you're going to be more magnetic more attractive and attract the right people to your your tribe and just you know be a yogi and live the yoga life you love namaste, yeah. that. namaste. thank you for joining me